Louis Vuitton is the most valuable luxury fashion brand in the world. Its CEO, Bernard Arnault, is also the second wealthiest man on the planet with a net worth of around $180 billion. Looking at Louis Vuitton's business and financial success today, you would never guess that the company was started by a man who was homeless during his teenage years, had no education, and slept in a forest. Louis Vuitton is a true business rags to riches story. But the company would also be the subject of a hostile takeover, countless lawsuits, and a host of other controversies. This is the insane story of Louis Vuitton, and how a tiny family business evolved into one of the most powerful brands in the world. LVMH is now a giant luxury fashion conglomerate, and the story of Louis Vuitton and Bernard Arnault, The Wolf in Kashmir, is a business mini-movie I think you're gonna enjoy. In this business success story, we'll look at how did Louis Vuitton start? Why is Louis Vuitton so popular? What is the history of Louis Vuitton and LVMH? And lots more about Louis Vuitton's extremely profitable business, a homeless boy in the 19th century. The history of this company dates back to the 19th century in the land of France, where a homeless teenager was dreaming of making loads of dough, at a time when he had no money to put a shelter over his head and no food to feed himself. He worked at odd jobs under artisans and craftsmen, doing paltry things to survive. The money he was paid for these was paltry as well. But the one good thing that came out of it was that he learned skills he couldn't have anywhere else. This homeless boy was none other than, no you guess wrong not Arnold, but Louis Vuitton himself. And yes, the brand is named after a person. Louis Vuitton was born to a farmer and hat maker, and due to their poor financial condition, he had to dip his hands in the mud of his farmland at a very young age. But this was just the start of it. Louis was just ten when his mother passed away, and his father remarried. His stepmother was just as you picture a stereotypical stepmother to be, wicked, cruel, and heartless. She made Louis's life a living hell. He tolerated her for years until he just couldn't anymore. When he turned thirteen, he absconded. This was when he had no food and no money. But his light wouldn't be dimmed by his miserable condition. When he worked under the craftsmen, he learned to work with metal, stone, fabrics, and wood. With the advent of the first railway in Paris, traveling was easier than it ever had been and aristocrats needed boxes to store their belongings. Louis decided to step up and found a job under a trunk maker and packer as an apprentice. Very soon, his work was appreciated by all and then the Empress of France herself appointed him as her personal box maker. Things started to look good thereon. After a year of working for the Empress, Louis opened his first shop. Now, he had the room to grow. He came up with ideas that changed the perception of people regarding fashion accessories. Louis started making the trunks of canvas instead of leather, as they were lighter, durable, and water-resistant. Louis made handbags cool and trendy in an era when they were considered inelegant and bulky. To keep up with the rising demand, Louis was joined by his son, Georges. Gradually younger generations kept on joining the business and not to sound insensitive, but the older generation started to pass away one by one. Below is the family tree explaining the hierarchy of the Vuitton family. But didn't we talk about an Arnault in the beginning? You must be like. I don't see him anywhere in sight. So here it is. The hostile takeover. The three brothers in the last family tree could not agree on the business-related decisions after their father's death. So they instead decided to hand over the reins to their sister's husband Henry Rackemeyer, the last legit Vuitton heir. We will continue the story from there. Under Henry, Louis Vuitton's sales reached from $20 million to $260 million in six years, following which, in 1984, Louis Vuitton was made public, IPO. By 1987, the sales of the company reached nearly $1 billion. But as the numbers rose, the threat of an outside takeover rose as well. To prevent this, Henry merged the century-old company with Moat Hennessy, a luxury champagne and cognac producer, to become the company we know today Louis Vuitton Moat Hennessy or LVMH. Slowing management disputes started to broil between Henry and the president of Moat Hennessy. 
Henry was on edge, and he asked an affluent property developer to be his ally and help him. The property developer agreed to it. But in a crazy turn of events, when Henry found himself stuck in the management of his company, the property developer was secretly buying a controlling interest in LVMH. By the time, the intentions of his so-called ally became clear to him, the ally had already bought 45% of the controlling interest. He also gained the favor of the administration of Moat Hennessy. Thus, when Henry was busy safeguarding his company from an outside takeover, his own close confidant stabbed him in the back and sided with the people he was hired to combat. A long legal battle went on between the ally and President Henry Rackemeyer. Finally, he won and kicked Henry out of his own company. Can you guess who this ally was? The Arnold we talked about. Bernard Arnold, the second richest man in the world. Bernard Arnold, CEO and Chairman, LVMH. Bernard Arnold, a French businessman, investor and art collector as Wiki would put it. The big changes. In the 80s, when the demand for luxury goods was on the rise, Arnold sensed the craze and found a failed French luxury brand. He bought the brand using his family's money and made some big changes. The changes involved discarding non-performing assets. But he did not stop there. He fired 9,000 employees of that company to cut down costs. You know this company as well. It is the luxury brand Dior. Arnold even got the name The Terminator for the same. The Arnold style. Arnold has a style and has become quite popular for executing it correctly. The thing he did to Henry Rackemeyer, he would do that to multiple companies. He would start buying stakes in a company indirectly through subsidiaries of LVMH, until LVMH essentially owned a controlling stake in that particular company. Arnold tried the same with Hermes, and so with Gucci, but failed in these two brands among all of his other victories. LVMH and Arnold have not stopped with this shopping spree. As of today, they own 75 luxury brands. 75. Top 5 Companies Owned by LVMH Tiffany & Company Has the pop culture not pictured this brand in good light enough for you to know how big this company is? A proposal is not a proposal if it is done without a Tiffany ring. And yes, it is owned by LVMH. LVMH acquired it in 2021 for $15.8 billion. This deal is believed to be the biggest luxury brand acquisition ever. Bulgari famous for its creative and colorful jewelry design, LVMH acquired this century-old luxury brand in 2011 for 3.7 billion euros. Fendi this brand is famous for making luxury fur and leather products, like coats, shoes, fragrances, and eyewear and it was acquired for an estimated $259.4 million in 2001. Christian Dior once failing and on the verge of shutting down, Dior is known for its designer clothing range. It was one of the first in the list of acquisitions of Arnold. He acquired it in 1984 for a symbolic price of one franc. LVMH technically acquired this brand in 2017 though, for $13.1 billion. Sephora with roughly 15,000 different products on their portfolio, this luxury personal care and beauty products brand was acquired in 1997 for a price that is not known to the general public. The bottom line. Well, we all have heard. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Bernard was both in this story. Bernard Arnold became the chairman and CEO of this mega brand in 1989 and has been intact in the position since then. The Louis Vuitton story wouldn't be a world's fave if Bernard wasn't in it. He helped the brand achieve the heights it is in today. Every once in a while, there comes a person who sabotages everything just to rebuild it from scratch. <laughs>